It's interesting in those two Bible readings we have from James and then from Mark, you almost have a, uh, a both sides of the coin, if you like. James is really saying uh, if, you, if your religion doesn't uh, mean that your actions are, um, you know, are changed, then your religion is nothing. Uh, in the Mark reading, what we have Jesus talking about is it doesn't matter about the outside religious stuff or the stuff that you do religiously. It's all about your heart. And they do go together. And they are part of the same coin. You can't sort of take one side of that argument and say, oh, well, it's all about actions. It's not about your, you know, your faith. Um, and you certainly can't take the other side and say, oh, well, it's all about the faith and it makes no difference about your actions. Uh, but it's, it's both of those things. Jesus is talking particularly in, uh, in this section to his disciples about that which comes from within you. He says, uh, you can't be defiled, you can't be made unclean by something that you eat, uh, but it's what comes out of you, you know, your mouth, it's what comes out of your, your heart and your mind. That's what shows whether you're clean or unclean. Now the context for this is, uh, as, as Johan was saying, it, he was talking to Jewish people um, and they had a bunch of different rules about uh, washing their hands or washing vessels and all of those things that are alluded to in this passage. Uh, I want to just touch on a, a bare few. Uh, I couldn't at all spend uh, you know, a, a whole uh, length of time trying to go in depth into all of these different rules and regulations. but. Uh, when it talks about the law, really that means the Ten Commandments. Um, but then uh, later on, the, the law became the Ten Commandments plus the first five books of the Bible um, and, and any of the laws in between. And mostly, mostly, they're principles that you would, you would learn this principle of life and then you would have to, as a Jewish person, you would apply that principle. You know, like, keep the Sabbath holy. And you would apply that principle to everyday situations. Well, several hundred years before Jesus came along, there was a movement amongst the Jewish people, uh, and we would now call them the scribes and the Pharisees, as they appear in this passage. Um, but they were a group of people who really weren't happy with just having a set of principles that you could apply, you know, or you might apply it this way, but then somebody else might apply it that way. They weren't happy with the you know, discrepancy of those kind of things. So they set about taking all the principles of the Ten Commandments and everything from the first five, book of, uh, first five books of the Bible and then made rules for every scenario, every possible uh, thing that could happen or every question where you'd say, now, does the rule mean this or does it... They wanted to have an answer for all of it, which meant hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules. Those rules, after the 400 years or so, by Jesus' day, well, they're now traditions. They're now things that we do religiously, day in and day out. And the washing of the hands is one of those traditions. It's based on some rules, which was based on a principle, um, and they ought to know all of the ins and outs of it, but a bit like you know, us coming along to church, we ought to know the ins and outs of why we're in green and what it means and uh, you know, all of the symbols around us, what the empty cross means and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm sure if we had a little pop quiz, what's the difference between a cross and a crucifix, you'd, you'd all know, wouldn't you? And because it's really significant. Do you want the answer before I move on? Or, um, the crucifix, as in the Catholic churches, have a body on it. Okay, that's a crucifix. We don't have that. Why not? Exactly, because he's risen. See, you do know. Okay, and the Jews did know all the ins and outs of their laws, but they get lost. 
in all of the laws, some of these principles get lost. And it's easy to do that. So the idea of the washing was, first your hands have to be clean. Okay, so you wash your hands, you know, with soap and water, right? But then, well, they didn't have soap, I guess, but you do the washing part to get the grime off. But then the, the ritual washing was, uh, first of all, you have to wash your hands with clean water that comes from a special stone jug, uh, and a stone jug can't be made unclean on the inside. The outside can be clean, but the inside can't be unclean. That's part of the law. And so you take water from the clean vessel and you pour it over your upturned hands from the fingers and it has to come down at least to the wrists. Okay. Um, so your, your hands are now cleaned by the clean water. Okay. But the water that was on your hands is still, you know, your hands are still wet, aren't they? Right. But the water is now unclean because it touched something unclean, which was your hands. So now you have to get the unclean water off your hands. So now you turn your hands down and then you know, somebody has to pour the water on from the wrists going down to get rid of the unclean water. Okay, so now your hands are ritually clean. And you would rub them with a fist on the inside of your palm as you're, uh, as you're doing the cleaning beforehand. So then it's up, wash the, the dirt off. Then it's down, wash the dirty water off. Now your hands are clean, ready for eating. And they swear, why aren't your disciples doing this really, really important tradition that is all about keeping the law and keeping yourself clean? Well, in the times of the Maccabees, which is sort of, they were a bunch of guys, Jewish leaders between... I guess where the Old Testament stops and where the New Testament starts, there's about a 400 year period there uh, where they were trying to run uh, and control the, uh, the Jewish people um, in a good way. They were trying to be good leaders. Um, there were lots of other countries trying to get rid of Jewish people and, um, and they were trying to stand up against them. And one of the ways that the outside countries uh, worked out who were Jews and who weren't Jews uh, was to bring people into the, uh, the outside ruler and say, well, you need to eat pork because they knew that good Jewish people wouldn't eat pork, okay? And because that was, again, one of these rules. So, and all through this time, people refused. Jewish people, by their thousands, would, res would refuse to eat a simple piece of pork knowing that that would then give them up as being traitorous to the enemy and um, being Jews and they would then be killed on the spot and they'd bring more people in and say eat pork and they'd say no we're, we're not going to eat the pork and off with their heads there was even a story of a, um, a mother who had seven sons um, uh, these are all true. I'm sort of making light of it because you don't want to know the gory details. This one's particularly gory, but I won't, uh, won't tell you about it. But anyhow, this mother had seven sons and um, uh, they basically sat the mother down and said, you know, uh, we want your, your, um, your sons to eat pork. And they proudly would say, well, no, we're never going to eat something unclean. And so they tortured that son uh, to death while the mum's watching. Then they brought in the second son and did the same to him, and he, no, no, I'm not going to eat pork. And all the time the mother's cheering them on, you know, well done, son, don't give in to temptation, don't eat these unclean things. And all seven sons were tortured in different horrible ways um, and killed in front of her. And that was all because they would not do what would defile them. They wouldn't break these rules that would make them unclean Jewish people. They would stick to God's word and to God's laws. And then Jesus comes along and says, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. And here's a whole group of people he's talking to whose families, whose uh, forefathers, whose nation have suffered and have given their lives to keep those laws and to keep these washing rituals and, and all the eating stuff, they've kept them 
with blood, sweat and tears, quite literally. And Jesus says, oh, nothing you eat defiles you. Did you guys not understand that? Now, it's not what you eat that makes you unclean. It's what, it's what your heart says. That's what makes you unclean. Can you imagine if, you know, seven of your sons had given their life to keep those commandments and would not eat unclean stuff? And then this religious guy comes along and goes, no, 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 you've got it all back to front. That doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter if he eats pork. That's fine. How do you feel all of a sudden when generation after generation have been, you know, dying for these laws? And then this guy comes along and says, but that makes no difference whatsoever. It's not the food that you eat. It's not whether you've washed your hands this way and then this way that makes you clean or not clean. It's what comes out of your heart and what comes out of your mind. That is what makes a person clean or unclean. It would have been really, really countercultural. You can see why sometimes the things Jesus said got Jewish people really angry and made lots of people, the scribes and Pharisees, want to kill him. But Jesus is pointing to this little discrepancy between your heart and your mind and the actions that you do. I read a story uh, this week about a Muslim man who was uh, literally had his knife in his hand, was chasing somebody down to go and murder them, uh, but then the bells rang out for the six o'clock prayer. So he knelt down and he prayed, and then he jumped up and uh, as quick as he could and went off to continue uh, to murder that person. See, when you make your religion all about the laws and keeping the laws, it can become that your actions don't count. If you keep the laws, then you're all sweet. As long as, you know, then that means that you can do whatever you like as long as you've kept the laws. You probably all heard of, of those stories of good Catholic boys who go out, you know, early on a... Uh, on a Saturday to uh, say confessions and then go out for the rest of the night doing whatever they like because they know they've said confession. Uh, well, maybe you haven't heard those sort of stories. Uh, just colloquialism, but it points to this kind of thing, this mentality that says, well, if the laws make me clean, as long as I keep those laws and I wash my hands, then I can do whatever I like. And Jesus is saying... That's not the case. That's not faith in God. It's not faith in God the way I want you to understand. And he does try and then turn everything that they knew up on their head. So what does that all mean for us? What comes out of our hearts and our minds, that's what God wants to save and transform. That's where God wants our best effort and our discipline. That's where God wants us to be faithful at the level of heart and mind. Not exclusive to what we do, but that's where our honesty, that's where bringing our self to God is really important. That's what he wants. It seems to me that this passage, uh, as detailed and as complex as it is, with so much in it, is an invitation simply for us to bring our hearts to God, to, to lay them bare, honestly. God knows who we are. God knows what's in our hearts. And that's what he wants to transform. So can we do that just for a moment? Just have a time of prayer and bring ourselves into God's presence. Let's pray. Loving Lord God, we sit here in your presence, but inwardly we kneel and we open our hands, our palms to you, and we lay ourselves, our whole lives, our hearts and our minds open. 
Take us. We are yours. You know what's in our hearts. You know our minds. Sometimes we are good. Sometimes our hearts are loving and kind. And our mind has the other's best at at the forefront, ahead of our own needs. But there are plenty of spaces where that's not the case. There are plenty of dark corners and shadows. Lord, come and deal with those. Come and deal with those lists that apply to us. All our foolish and selfish ways. All the times that we replace you with something less than God and we worship that or chase after that instead. For all of those weak and dark places in heart and mind, Lord God, come and shine your light. Bring your word of truth that illuminates and clarifies. Bring the life and the love of Christ that is the path and is the way. Transform us, dear Lord, by your spirit working in small ways, leading us ever onward to you. That our hearts might be wholly yours. And that our living might take on something of your kingdom and look like your world. Lord God, we pray, continue to work in us this day and in the days of this week. We ask through Jesus' name, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.